The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. It is just my great honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Rob Knight. He's professor in the Department of Pediatrics with an additional appointment in the Department of Computer Science here at UC San Diego and co-founder of the American Gut Project. That sounds interesting. Since 2010, Dr. Knight has been involved with the most ambitious effort yet to probe the microbiota the Earth Microbi Microbiome Project, which is a collaborative effort to sequence and characterize the microbial communities in at least 200,000 environmental samples, such as soils and water collected from around the world. This is really interesting stuff, and we're excited to learn more about it. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Knight. Okay, so um, so thanks for the kind invitation to be here and that uh, and for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone who uh, made this possible, including Dilip Jeste, the uh, director of the Stein Institute, and uh, all of the sponsors of this event. Um, given that this is an event uh, about healthy aging, what I'm going to tell you about is some of the latest research connecting aging to the microbiome, which as I'll explain is the remarkable and indeed dizzying coll collection of cells that each of us harbors on and inside our bodies. Um, so I'd like to begin by asking you just to consider, what did you see when you looked in the mirror this morning? <laughs> I saw an organism that was 43% human, and not just because I hadn't had my damn coffee at that point in the day. But uh, as we'll see, uh, science is really starting to lead us to reconceptualize what we once thought of as our bodies. So uh, when we think of what makes up our bodies, each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, uh, but about 39 trillion microbial cells. And so that's where that 43% human number comes from. Only 43% of the cells associated with your body are uh, eukaryotic rather than, uh, rather than bacterial in origin. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, it's not really our cell count we should worry about, but rather uh, our DNA, right? The DNA revolution is really changing how we think about biology. So let's think about that again at the gene level. So the human genome consists of about 20,000 human genes, depending on what exactly you want to count. But the size of the microbial gene catalog ranges from 2 to 20 million microbial genes. So at the DNA level, we're at best 1% human. And you probably heard a lot of excitement about systems biology, systems medicine, and so forth. But it's pretty hard to do systems anything if you're neglecting 99% of that system, which is what we're effectively doing when we neglect all of those microbial genes that are providing all these metabolic functions that are not even encoded in our human genome. So uh, one thing that's been particularly remarkable over the 20th century has been the decline in infectious disease. And this has been a remarkable public health success, right? So over the 20th century, diseases caused by infections with single organisms, ranging from measles to, uh, to tuberculosis, have declined precipitously in frequency. But at the same time, uh, we've seen this tremendous rise in chronic diseases, uh, ranging from multiple sclerosis to type 1 diabetes uh, to asthma to Crohn's disease. And so we're really moving away from this infectious disease paradigm, where most of the illnesses are things uh, where it's an infection that you have to treat, uh, to a paradigm where most of the diseases that affect people are chronic diseases that you have to manage over a lifetime and into old age. And one thing that's particularly fascinating is that in 2002, when this article was published in the New England Journal, one of the leading medical journals, none of these diseases had been linked to the microbiome in any way. Whereas today, uh, we know both from association studies in humans and from animal experimentation studies uh, that all of these diseases are linked to the microbiome in humans and can, cause, um, and, and, and can be caused by microbial changes in animal models. 
And uh, one, one particularly compelling hypothesis about this is a hygiene hypothesis uh, that we may have lost microbes that we have co-evolved with that are essential for educating our immune systems in the same way that we had lost through industrial processing many of the vitamins that we had co-evolved with uh, that needed to be resupplied into the food supply, whether you're talking about fortifying bread with B-complex vitamins or fortifying milk with vitamin D or all of the other uh, uh, revolutionary public health successes of the last century. And so one very important question is, uh, are some of these modern plagues caused by a uh, lack of microbes that we have, uh, that, that, that we've uh, left behind, but that are an essential part of our uh, physiology and our evolution? So, um, so the concept that a lot of this uh, is coming from food and that you are what you eat is not a new one. So, um, so, uh, so, so uh, th this is an idea that really dates back to, uh, back to Hippocrates. But one thing that's especially interesting um, is a newer concept uh, promoted by, uh, by, by, Jeff, uh, by Dr. Jeff Land in particular, uh, that, um, that, that food is really a language that speaks to our genes. So our genes are fixed at birth, but how those genes are expressed and whether you'll be healthy or sick depends a lot uh, on things that you do during your lifetime. And the language that the, that, that food speaks in is largely color. And all of the colors that you see when you eat a diverse diet uh, of brightly colored fruits and vegetables, um, all of those colors correspond to different molecules that have different effects on your body as they speak to your genes, whether you're talking about the lycopenoids uh, that make the tomatoes red, or the, carot uh, the carotenoids that make carrots orange, uh, or, or, um, or the anthocyanins that make blueberry, uh, blueberries blue. You have this amazing language of color uh, that speaks to your genes through the food that you eat. Now, uh, I, I have to admit that, um, that uh, my five-year-old also gets uh, exposure to a wide range of colors and foods. But when we go to the uh, store closest to our house, we're instead confronted with this array of colors. And uh, what, what's particularly ironic about this is that the slogan is all the good stuff. And uh, you could certainly argue that all of the good stuff had been carefully stripped out through industrial processing, right? And so what we're just learning to do at the moment is to understand uh, what needs to be resupplied in order to speak to our own genes and to our microbial genes, because in many ways uh, the microbial genes are acting as an amplifier uh, that, allows, uh, the, that allows the food to speak its message. So, um, so when, 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 we think of, uh, when we think of modern foods, uh, we often think of the obesity epidemic. And uh, work that I've been doing over the last, um, uh, over, the last uh, uh, um, over the last 12 years, together with a range of collaborators, but especially uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gordon at Washington University, has been has, has really been focusing on uh, the link between microbes and obesity. And uh, obesity is uh, obesity is a very important problem in healthy aging. Um, this is this is this is not to be at all judgmental, uh, but it's just a demographic fact that uh, in general uh, people who are uh, people who are lean tend to age more healthily than people who are uh, who are obese and uh, we've been able to make a tremendous amount of progress uh, linking obesity to microbial genes. So today, for example, I can tell you with 90% accuracy whether you're lean or obese by sequencing your microbial genes and uh, looking at the differences between them. Um, on the other hand, uh, we don't think it has a lot of commercial potential as a test for obesity, right? Because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese, knowing absolutely nothing about their microbes. But uh, on the other hand, if we try to do this task, lean or obese, based on human genes instead of microbial genes, we can only do that task with 57% uh, accuracy using every microbial gene, uh, sorry, using every human gene that's ever been linked to obesity by genome-wide association studies. Whereas if we instead look at the microbial genes, we can do this task with 90% accuracy. And the even more exciting part of this is, uh, remember I told you that your human genes are fixed at birth, whereas as I'll show you, your microbial genes are changing every day based on different things that you do, and the potential for making a difference through your microbial genes is therefore enormous. Um, the, the, other, uh, the, uh, the, the other thing we can do is we can change microbial genes deliberately. Um, so uh, work that we did with uh, Jeff Gordon's lab, led by a very talented uh, grad student called Vanessa Rodara, uh, essentially we asked, can we, uh, can we prove causality by asking whether the microbial difference between le lean and obese humans can be transplanted into mice? 
And so the experimental design for this was to begin with mice that are raised in, uh, in a germ-free bubble with absolutely no microbes of their own. And then if you transplant to them uh, the fecal microbes of an obese person, uh, what you get is a fat mouse. Whereas in contrast, if you transplant in the microbes from a lean person, uh, you get a lean mouse instead. And this is amazing because what it shows is the difference in microbial communities and the microbiomes between the obese and the lean people can make a physiological difference even when transplanted across the species boundary to different kinds of mice. And what, what's particularly amazing about this, and we've seen this in a number of different genetic models and diet-induced models and other models of obesity at this point, is that why the mice become obese is different depending on what kind of obesity it is. So uh, with the initial genetic model we studied called the OB model, uh, the mice become obese because they're much more efficient at processing the food in their diet. So their microbiomes are much more efficient and they gain more calories from the same in, uh, food input. But from another kind of model uh, that we call the TLR5 knockout model, in that model, they're exactly as efficient as a normal mouse at extracting the energy from their diet. What's happening instead is that the altered microbiome changes the mouse's behavior. So it's hungrier and it eats more, and that's why it becomes obese. So you can cure it by putting in its cage the amount of food a normal mouse would eat, and you can cure it with antibiotics. Um, and what's most amazing is that you can transmit this from mouse to mouse to mouse, even to genetically normal mice, by transmitting the microbiomes. And, um, and, and so uh, when we picture the obesity epidemic, uh, all of this makes a tremendous amount of sense. And so uh, this map is from the CDC, just tracking the obesity epidemic from 1985 uh, to 2010, so a period of 25 years. And back in 1985, obesity wasn't that much of a problem, right? There were a few states with 10% obesity uh, or below uh, in light blue, uh, a few with uh, 10 to 14% um, obesity in slightly darker blue, and most states weren't even tracking it. But if you look over the span of 25 years, and each, each frame in this is a year, you can see obesity starting over here and just spreading throughout the rest of the United States until it becomes more and more of a problem, until it's the public health disaster that it is today. And uh, th this, this is really why we can pin it on something other than changes in human genes, right? Because for human genes to have changed that rapidly over a span of 25 years, just, just within one generation, either all of the lean people would have had to have had essentially no kids, or all of the obese people would have had to have had a tremendous, uh, a tremendous number of kids. And in either, either of those cases, it would have been very obvious uh, just from a demographic perspective, right? So that's why we have to look for, uh, for environmental causes. And so one particularly exciting possibility is that the obesity epidemic is literally an epidemic in terms of transmitting an obesogenic microbiome from human to human, just as we've shown that we can transmit it from mouse to mouse and even from humans to mice. Uh, one thing that's fascinating in this context is, um, is, is another map, and so this is a map of antibiotic utilization uh, in the United States in 2010. And you can probably see a lot of visual similarities between that and the last map I showed you. And when I put them side by side, uh, what you can see is a tremendous uh, similarity between the antibiotic map and the obesity map. And uh, the, this, the, this kind of association doesn't prove causality, but Marty Blazer, whose book I mentioned earlier, has done a tremendously elegant series of experiments in mice, showing that both with subtherapeutic antibiotics, so low, dose, low doses of antibiotics like you might get from the environment from eating antibiotics in food, and also with therapeutic doses of antibiotics, uh, if you give those to a mouse in early age, it can, become ob uh, it can become obese later in life, and it can also dramatically shorten the mouse's lifespan. Um, so, so these kinds of microbial transplants prove causality, and uh, one thing that's especially exciting about them that I won't go too much into today, but I'll just briefly mention, is that in addition to transmitting traits like obesity, like I showed you here, and things like inflammatory bowel disease, which has also been linked to the microbiome, uh, it's even possible to transmit behavior uh, between different kinds of mice by, tra by transmitting their microbes. So for example, a group at McMaster University in Canada was able to show that you can make a bold mouse timid or a timid mouse bold not by changing their mouse genes, but by changing their microbiomes instead. 
And this also extends to uh, neurological disorders. Uh, so this is some work we did very recently with Sarkis Masmanian's group at Caltech. Uh, uh, Sarkis is, uh, is, is a MacArthur Genius Award winner and definitely uh, deserves every bit of that title. And uh, what, uh, what, what Sarkis was wondering was basically, could you transmit something um, associated with old age, uh, like Parkinson's disease, from humans into mice? And so the experimental design here was to take mice that had a genetic defect uh, similar to a change in uh, human genes that has been associated with Parkinson's disease. And then if we transmit into those mice the fecal contents of a human, uh, of a human with Parkinson's, the mice develop symptoms very reminiscent of human Parkinson's disease. Uh, in contrast, if we transmit to them the microbiome of someone who's healthy, they do not develop any of those symptoms. So again, this is very strong evidence that suggests that uh, the microbiome could be linked not just, to, uh, not, not just to diseases that occur earlier in life, but to diseases that, that occur much later in life, uh, like Parkinson's. Um, and these neurological diseases are exactly the kind of thing that until recently were completely unsuspected to be linked to the microbiome. Um, and we, uh, and, um, and uh, one, one thing that's particularly interesting in terms of nutrition, uh, I showed you some, uh, some results from the microbiome and obesity, but under nutrition, it turns out, also has a tremendous microbiome component. And this is more work with Jeff Gordon's group at WashU. And what we're looking at here is Kwashiorkor, which was thought to be a profound nutritional deficiency. But what's really interesting is that in Malawi, where you have a very high rate of, uh, of, of, of uh, identical twinning, um, what you see is very frequently you have identical twins that are living in the same household, they have the same genes, and uh, their parents insist that they have the same amount of the same diet. And yet very frequently what we will see is that one twin will develop this profound, uh, th this profound uh, uh, disease uh, of, se of severe malnutrition, whereas the other twin will be completely fine. And so uh, Michelle Smith and Jeff's lab did uh, a series of exp uh, very elegant experiments just transplanting the microbiomes from these individual children into mice. And if you take the quashed microbiome and you transplant it into a mouse, the mouse does very badly. So it loses 30% of its body weight within three weeks, and it dies if it remains untreated. Uh, but what's amazing is that that's not what happens when you transplant the microbiome from the twin of that individual who's completely healthy. And what's even more amazing is that we can rescue those mice using the same ready-to-use therapeutic food, uh, a peanut butter-based supplement uh, that's used in the clinic in, Mal in Malawi. And that has a huge effect on the microbiome and on the physiology if the mouse received the microbiome from a child with kwashiorkor, but not if the mouse received a healthy child's microbiome. And so what's especially exciting about this is it pilots the idea uh, that, you can, uh, that, that you can detect using the microbiome what kind of nutritional intervention an individual person needs and then potentially use that to uh, transplant someone's microbiome into a whole set of different mice and then try out different interventions on those mice, whether it's nutritional or whether it's drug interventions or whether it's even things like exercise or uh, other factors that are known to interact with the microbiome and then translate that back into the patient to figure out what would work for that individual. And uh, David Brenner, um, our Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences, is really pioneering this concept of avatar mice, uh, where you can modify the mice in different ways, including the microbiome, uh, to make them resemble an individual human patient to figure out what would work for you based on what works in these sets of mice. Uh, so that, that, uh, that, that may all sound a little far-fetched, but uh, remember that one of the big issues with any, uh, with, with any project in human nutrition has been the tremendous degree of variation among different individuals. So uh, what I'm showing you here is just a summary of one of the largest studies that was ever done uh, in human nutrition. And so this is from a group at Harvard, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they tracked 120,000 people for 20 years doing complete food histories on all of those people and trying to figure out which individual food items have a large effect and which have a small effect, uh, in this case primarily focused on weight. But they're also, as part of this project, very interested in other factors, including overall burden of disease and including rates of aging. Uh, so it's probably not going to surprise you a whole lot which are the food items that are particularly good and particularly bad from a weight management perspective. So uh, the best food item in terms of weight loss is yogurt. Uh, and uh, for every additional serving of yogurt that people, eat, uh, that people ate every day, uh, on average, uh, they lost um, a little less than a pound per year. So on the one hand, um, so, so on the one hand, it's a food that's associated with weight loss in the population. On the other hand, you might think that eating yogurt every 
every single day for a year and then losing less than a pound at the end of that year might not be a very impressive effect, but it's the largest effect that there was. Um, in case you're wondering which food was second on the list, it was nuts. And you might find that very surprising given, uh, given how calorie dense nuts are. But one thing that's interesting about nuts and other seeds is that they tend to have a whole lot of mechanisms to stop some animals subsisting on that one plant as its sole dietary source. So they tend to have a lot of strategies for making you less hungry or uh, for inhibiting your uptake of other nutrients or other, um, or, or, or other, uh, other ways of trying to stop you from just gorging on the seeds of one particular plant. And so, so it's very interesting that nuts are associated with weight loss rather than weight gain. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, it's probably not going to surprise you which food is the worst from a weight loss perspective. Um, and uh, it's our friend the fry. But uh, again, for each additional serving of fries that people ate every single day, the average weight loss, uh, sorry, the average weight gain over this period was a little, um, was a little over a pound and a half. And so this is amazing, right? Because what it means is if every single day, if you're an average person, you virtuously forego the serving of fries you were going to eat, and instead you eat a serving of yogurt, at the end of that year, uh, exercising that willpower 365 times, you would expect to see a difference of two and a half pounds in your weight. Right, so on the population average basis, uh, these results are not very impressive, but they're very inconsistent with, um, with, with the clinical perspective that, uh, that a lot of physicians see, um, and also with probably your, your own uh, individual experience as a human being, that uh, for any individual, adding a particular item to your diet or cutting it out of your diet can have a very large or a very small effect for you. So, um, so, so, a, so a groundbreaking study uh, from, uh, from an Israeli group uh, last, uh, um, at, at the end of last year, sorry, at the end of um, 2015 rather, really revolutionized our understanding of why these individual differences exist and what they're linked to. And so this is from Aaron Segal and Aaron Allen Abzibes at the Weizmann Institute. And uh, what they did was remarkable. So what they did is they took 800 people and they hooked them up to continuous glucose monitors so they could continuously monitor their glucose um, and were getting readouts every few minutes and automatically recording them. And then they fed them a, a standardized sequence of diets so that they could tell exactly what is the effect of each individual food item on blood glucose for each one of those 800 people over a two week period. So what they found was really interesting because what they found is that although when they averaged the results for each food item, for, each, for all of those 800 people together, they perfectly recaptured the glycemic index for each of those foods to within a couple of percent. But when they calculated an individual glycemic index for each person, uh, each person as an individual, what they found is that the same food had totally different effects on different people. And one of the punchlines of the study that was widely reported is that for some people it's actually better to eat a bowl of ice cream than it is to eat a bowl of white rice. And amazingly, almost all of this variation is not due to your human genes and not due to your physiology or your blood readings, which they also measured, or uh, other, other things that they can measure about you, but rather due to the micro biome, which explains almost everything in their model. So uh, I'm learning this, people typically have two questions. And the first of these questions is, is there a test that I can do to tell if I'm in the rice category or in the ice cream category? <laughs> And, uh, and, and the answer is yes, but right now it only works if you're Israeli. And this is one of the things that we urgently need to test in other populations where the microbiome backgrounds are very different and where the background uh, in terms of dietary choices is very different as well. And then the second and much more interesting question is, uh, could you actually, uh, you know, suppose you found out that you were in the, in the rice category and you wanted to be in the ice cream category, could you actually change your microbiome to achieve that? And this is exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to work towards at the moment. Uh, can you look at what your microbiome should look like in the future and then make the right changes to move your microbiome from where you are right now towards that? And I'll show you some more examples of that later in the talk. Um, but a lot of these food, uh, food item choices are very surprising. So for example, there was one subject whose blood glucose spiked every time they ate tomatoes. And uh, cutting the tomatoes out of the diet of that individual brought their blood glucose under control in a way that had not been possible beforehand. So it's amazing how even uh, things that are considered as healthy, and in fact are healthy for most people in the population, can have really devastating effects in terms of uh, blood glucose for one particular individual. And the same is likely true in terms of other factors, including weight gain, and including accelerated aging. 
Um, so one, one thing we're working on at the moment is the study of centenarians, and this is, um, th this is being led by, uh, by, by, um, by, by Alan Maisels and, uh, and Nick Shork. And so uh, last year we went to this, um, uh, we, we, went to, uh, we, we went to Aciaroli, uh, a village in the Chilento Peninsula of Italy, where there's a very high rate of centenarians. And a lot of the goal of this project is to find out why, like is it an aspect of their lifestyle, is it an aspect of their diet, uh, is it genetic, um, is it some, uh, is, is it some other factor. And one of the reasons why we're particularly uh, eager to find out if it's a diet or if it's a microbiome or if it's some other lifestyle thing is it would be really nice to figure out um, it would be really nice to figure out how to transport the findings from this population and other so-called blue zones around the world where people age uh, particularly healthily and uh, have, have both long lives and healthy lives. It would be really good to be able to translate those findings here in the United States and elsewhere. So, um, so one one thing that we uh, so one one thing that we um, uh, started looking at early on uh, was rosemary, which is a major component of the diet of the uh, of, of the centenarians in uh, in, in Chilento. And uh, one one thing that's particularly interesting is that they still forage a lot of their food wild. So a lot of the herbs that they eat, they're getting uh, they're, they're getting literally from the wild, uh, from roadsides and uh, and and uh, walking through the hills and so forth. And uh, they're they're only uh, they're, they're only getting a minority of their food. Uh, by, uh, from buying it at, mar at market. And there's been a lot of studies, especially in animals, of rosemary and particular, uh, particular compounds out of rosemary. And, and so then the question is, is there anything special about the rosemary in Chilento, uh, which, um, which, uh, which is uh, useful for, for promoting healthy aging? Or uh, is it something about rosemary in general? Or, uh, or, or what is it? So uh, together with Peter Durrestein, uh, we've been exploring this, starting closer to home. So this is the Skag School of Pharmacy. Uh, you might have, you might recognise the sign from when you probably drove past it to come to this event. Uh, it's, it's literally across the road here, and uh, that's a rosemary bush that was growing right next to the sign. Uh, I'm afraid we pillaged it a little in the name of science. And uh, basically, uh, basically took a sprig that contained uh, stems and flowers and leaves and so forth, and then uh, used a technique called mass spectrometry, uh, together with uh, molecular 3D cartography, where what we can do is we can scan in the rosemary plant and then take these samples, look at all of the chemicals in these samples, and paint them back onto the plant itself. So, uh, so, um, so what we get is this 3D model where for any chemical that we find, and we can also do this for any microbe that we find, uh, we can just ask where it is on the plant and are, are there any interesting patterns there. And so this is really a process of a tremendous amount of discovery at the moment uh, because there's a few compounds that we know uh, already uh, that are associated with rosemary. What you can see is that they have different distributions. So the way, the way to read these color maps is that blue uh, means that you have the least of a particular molecule, red means that you, that you have the most. So some of them are unevenly distributed. Uh, some of them are concentrated in particular locations. Uh, so for, for example, you can see that this molecule der derived from camphorol is primarily located in the flowers of the rosemary. And uh, we can do this for a whole range of other metabolites, uh, where what you can see is that they have very different spatial distributions. So depending on which of these molecules are good, you might want to focus on the flowers or the leaves or the stems. And, uh, and, and one of the most amazing things is that there's a huge number of molecules where we have no idea what they are. So you can think of mass spectrometry as being like a very, uh, very precise set of scales where you can weigh individual molecules one at a time. And uh, most of the molecules that are most associated with particular parts of the plant, uh, like for example right out at the growing tips or uh, the flowers or other pieces, all we know is how much, we, uh, how much they weigh and we don't know anything else about them. But that's exactly the kind of natural products characterization that we can use to take these leads and then, ask, uh, then go back to the, uh, the, the people of Chilento and ask, you know, what, what part of the rosemary do you eat? Is it different parts at different times of year? Do you eat the flowers uh, uh, on, on special occasions and that kind of thing? try to translate that behavior uh, back into molecular ideas that we can test in the lab. Um, so there's a bunch, uh, like there's a bunch of these molecules. Uh, one, one thing that's particularly, um, particularly interesting is how different these distributions are. So depending on what turns out to be important, uh, you might want to look at the young leaves or the old leaves. You might even want to pick out the stems. And so uh, this is the kind of thing where we can start feeding, uh, feeding them in animal models of various kinds and seeing if any of them makes a mouse or even a fish live longer. 
Um, we've also been we've also been extending this to other plants. So this is Dimitri Floris, uh, one of uh, one of Peter Doristein's um, very talented grad students, uh, who made a 3D model of a tomato plant. And again, uh, the kind of thing we can do extends to tomatoes, to peppers, uh, to essentially any plant that we can scan and look at the distribution of molecules in that plant. So what this is doing is completely transforming our understanding of the diet that we eat, uh, because depending on how you grow that plant, uh, uh, like uh, the soil that it's in, the amount of water that it has, uh, how many insects are attacking it and so forth, uh, the compounds that it makes, including compounds that almost certainly have an impact on our health, are going to be completely different. And we never had the technology to find this out, especially at this kind of uh, resolution over the whole plant, until just a year or two ago. So, um, so, so I'm going to move into. Um, so, I'm going to, uh, so, so, so on the basis of this, you might be wondering, well, uh, you know, um, can we use this kind of mapping technology uh, to map our own microbiomes? And uh, that, that's been the focus of a lot, a lot of the work I've done, both in the two years that I've been at UC San Diego, and then uh, most of the most of the 13 years before that that I was at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, one very important project that um, that my lab played a number of roles in uh, was the Human Microbiome Project, uh, where together with about 400 researchers, um, 400 other researchers around the country, uh, we looked at a cohort where, uh, in the 2012 paper, uh, we, we published the results from about 250 people. Uh, sampled it up to 18 sites on the body, which as you can imagine is a lot of places to stick a Q-tip. And um, in this project we collected four and a half trillion bases of DNA. So to put that in perspective, your human genome is about three billion bases. And so what this means is that we collect a DNA equivalent to 1,500 times the size of the human genome. And uh, one thing that was remarkable about this project is how rapidly the results escaped the pages of the scientific journals like Science and Nature, so that just a few weeks after that it was on the cover of Scientific American, and just a couple of weeks after that it was on the, on the cover of The Economist. And what's amazing is how microbiome science is not just really interesting from a, uh, from a scientific perspective, but it is also becoming a really big business. So there are microbiome companies with over billion dollar valuations now that simply didn't exist when we were doing the Human Microbiome Project just a few years ago. Um, the problem with collecting those four and a half trillion bases of data, though, uh, was that we did have a lot of data to look at. So to illustrate this, I'm just showing you the first file of data from the Human Microbiome Project. And um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, like what we're doing is fundamentally an ecology project where we're looking at which kinds of microbes are in which samples uh, based, based on the DNA that we read out. But it's pretty hard to tell who lives where in the environment from this kind of information, right? And the worst part is I'm just showing you the first 0.1% of the file, and there's another 17,000 files just like it. Uh, so you probably can't even tell that that sample's from the mouth, let alone the sequence, uh, sequence signatures that let us determine this. And this was really a problem given the excitement around getting your microbiome uh, profiled. So both in public projects like the American Gut Project that I'll tell you about, which is a, a crowdsourced, crowdfunded project that I run, and various companies, you can get your microbiome profiled. And um, unfortunately, some companies are promoting the idea that you can do something actionable with that data right now. And so this is leading to a lot of people showing up in their doctor's offices uh, with their microbiome profiles, probably saying, you know, uh, you, know you know, Doc, I got this readout of a thousand, a thousand microbes that are in my gut, and isn't that amazing? Or, you know, better yet, I got this readout of a million genes that are in my gut. And, you know, surely with all this information and the 15 beautiful minutes we have together, you can tell me what's wrong with me, right? And, and I mean, what's your doctor going to do? Uh, I guess they can refer you to their colleagues in psychiatry for being crazy enough to, to think they can do something with that. But uh, what our mission is at the moment is to make it not crazy anymore, right? Because these profiles are very hard to understand in isolation. But if you compare them to other, uh, to other, you know, to other people, or you compare them to, to, the, to the same person over time, like if you have a lot of microbiome profiles as your health changes, then we can really do something with that. And that's the kind of vision that we have for how microbiome science is going to develop. So uh, when we use technologies developed in my lab to take all that data from the HMP, we can distill it into this kind of map. And you're probably thinking, well, you know, what is this? I don't understand that any better than I understood those sequences you showed me just before. But just bear with me for a moment. So each point on this map represents all of the complexity in a given microbial community as read out from its DNA. So this complex oral microbiome, we read out the DNA, and it turns into just one point on this map. And the way we lay out these points is that two points are close 
together if they share microbes that have more similar evolutionary history, and two points further apart uh, if we're looking at microbes that have more dissimilar evolutionary history. And so we take all that evolutionary information, and that's how we can place your sample on the map based on the evolution of the microbes that are in that sample. Um, so remember this was about 250 people at a whole bunch of places on the body. And you might wonder what makes the difference between two microbiome samples. Is it whether you're young or old, or uh, is, it how, um, is, is it the consistency of your, your stool, for example? Is it whether you're, um, uh, is, 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 it, uh, is, is it what race you are? Uh, is it whether you're male or female? Um, it turns out that the main thing that matters uh, is what part of the body you sample from. So you can see almost like different continents on this map. The mouth is very different uh, from the skin, from the vaginal co uh, community, and from the fecal community. And uh, what, what, was, what was especially interesting about this, so we didn't really understand until we did the Earth Microbiome Project uh, how profoundly different the microbes in these different parts of the body are. And to highlight this, if I show you the, the mouth and the gut from the first person in the HMP, you see their mouth and their stool are almost on different continents on this map. So when we got the data from the Earth Microbiome Project, what we could do is we could go out there in the environment and uh, we, could, we, we could just ask what two samples on Earth are exactly the same distance, as pa distance apart in terms of their microbes as the mouth and the gut of the same person. Uh, okay, so if you think of your mouth as being kind of like a coral reef, where you have these complex mineralized communities covered with biofilms that maybe your dentist pesters you about from time to time, the remarkable fact is that your mouth is as far away from your gut in terms of microbial ecology as the microbes in this reef are uh, from the microbes in the dirt on this prairie. Right? So they're essentially non-overlapping, completely different microbiomes. And what that means is that a few feet along the length of your body makes as much as a, uh, of a difference to your microbes as thousands of miles across the Earth's surface. So it's not that you have one microbiome, but rather that you have a whole, uh, a whole archipelago of different microbiomes around your body that probably all communicate with one another in important ways that we're just beginning to understand. So, uh, so this may lead you to wonder, well, um, how, uh, how, uh, how, how do, uh, you know, do, do I have my own microbiome journey through this map? And in particular, uh, if my microbiome is a journey through this map, where am I going to, where am I going to begin on this map? And uh, where do my first microbes come from? And uh, if you have dogs or kids as I do, you likely have some dark suspicions about that, uh, all of which turn out to be true, by the way. So we can, actu uh, we can actually match you up to your dog pretty accurately by looking at the microbes that you share. But in all seriousness, how we're born has a tremendous impact uh, on babies' first microbes. And what I'm showing you here is one of these maps where, uh, with Maria Gloria dominguez Bello, now at NYU, we looked at mothers an hour before they gave birth, and then at their babies 20 minutes after birth. And uh, samples from all over the bodies of babies delivered vaginally uh, in pink here, you can see cluster with the vaginal samples from all of the mothers. Whereas in contrast, in light blue, we have samples from all of the babies who were delivered by C-section. And in dark blue, we have the skin samples from all of the mothers. And so what this means is that how you're born has a profound impact on the first microbes that you get at birth. And we think that this may uh, explain some of the differences in health between vaginally delivered and C-section babies, where if you're delivered by C-section, uh, you're more likely to have asthma, to have allergies, to have atopic disease. Some studies have, have even indicated a twofold increased risk of autism. And all of these diseases have been recently connected to the microbiome. Uh, now, before you panic, remember that the most likely outcome of, of C-section is that you're going to be fine and the kid is going to be fine, right? But when we add these up, uh, add these increased ra rates up over a large population of hundreds of millions of people, it, becomes to, uh, it starts to become a major public health difference. And so one thing we're trying to figure out at the moment is can you restore those vaginal microbes that you would normally be born with if you're delivered by C-section? And if you can do that, does it have any impact on your health? And so we're working with investigators in a number of places, including including NYU and including Rady Children's Hospital to try to determine that at the moment. Um, so you might be wondering, okay, so uh, if you start off with microbes depending on your delivery mode, where do you go after that? And this is work we did with Ruth Lay, who's now a director at the Max Planck Institute. And uh, what we're looking at here um, is, the, is the development of one, uh, one child's micro, uh, microbiome over the first two and a half years of life. And in case you're wondering why two and a half years, that's when the kid was toilet trained. And as you can imagine, it's way easier to get the fecal sample out of a diaper than to fight a toddler who's proudly learned how to flush for every single sample. So a lot of studies tend to, tend to end at about that age for practical reasons.
Um, okay, so, uh, so the fecal sample starts off in the vaginal region um, of the map, which is consistent with what we know about this particular child's delivery mode. And then the question is, over those two and a half years, uh, how much does he come to, re to resemble the adult fecal state? Like, how complete is the development? Is the progress fast or slow? Is it a smooth progression? Are there any interesting events along the way or what? And uh, what you can see is sometimes there's a huge amount of change one week to the next. Other times there's just a little change. Remember what matters on this map is mainly the distance between two samples. And some of these changes one week to the next, so each frame in this is a week. Some of these differences are bigger than the differences between any two adults in the Human Microbiome Project. So if you think that your kid is a different person one week to the next, that's literally true in terms of their microbiome. And uh, coming up here is something fascinating. So he gets antibiotics for an ear infection. You see this tremendous regression of the microbiome, followed by a rapid recovery. Now that went by pretty fast, so I'm just going to rewind it for you, and I'm going to play it again. Uh, so what we see is on administration of uh, oral amoxicillin for an ear infection, we see this tremendous regression of the microbiome, undoing months of normal development in just a few weeks, followed by a relatively, a relatively rapid recovery. And then by the time he gets to two and a half years, he's more or less in the healthy adult part of the distribution. But that doesn't happen with every kid. And uh, some kids, and also some adults, as we're hearing uh, through, through people who enroll in American gut, find themselves permanently changed in one way or another, or another through antibiotics, whether, th whether it's weight gain or weight loss, uh, whether it's things like changes in cognition even. And we're starting to wonder whether a lot of these are linked to the microbiome. And if you could tell if your microbiome was going to be resilient before you took antibiotics to maybe guide that prescription choice. Um, so this takes me to the American Gut Project. Uh, I'll, um, sorry, I should, have, I should have mentioned that we're also doing this kind of thing uh, at the other end of life, uh, but, but in general the results are a lot, a lot less dramatic than that development over the first three years on this kind of diagram. And so uh, we're also very interested in working with uh, people at the Stein Institute to do exactly the same kinds of things that we've, we've done in the first three years of life over the last three or four decades, where, uh, where we think the results are going to be tremendously important, um, both for understanding uh, what's likely to happen to given individual and also for making recommendations for change. So, so with this kind of information, a lot of people have been very interested to figure out where they personally are on this kind of microbial map. And uh, we launched the American Gut Project uh, back, in, um, back over Thanksgiving of 2012, uh, Thanksgiving being a time when a lot of Americans are thinking about their gut for some reason. And uh, basically the idea was to, uh, to do something kind of like National Geographic's Genographic Project, where, uh, where, where what they're doing is essentially having each individual uh, cover the cost of adding them to the project uh, through crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. So, so you can look at what a lot of people look like, uh, in, in, in this case in terms of their microbiome, while scaling the project indefinitely as long as people are interested in signing up. Uh, one, one, one person who was particularly interested in this was Larry Smarr, uh, who's the director of our uh, CalIT2 inst uh, Institute that's just across campus. And this is a 64 million, uh, million pixel display wall over at CalIT2 where I was explaining to him the uh, Human Microbiome Project results. And he was saying, well, you know, uh, I have a very interesting microbiome because uh, I'm an IBD patient, and how do I get myself into this project? And um, so, uh, so, so the, way, the way to do that, like every new faculty member gets a certain amount of crap from their colleagues, and in my case it's literally been true, because this box of Larry's stool showed up in my lab on dry ice. Larry's a very interesting guy, because he's uh, not, not just because of that box, but he's a leader in the quantified self movement. So for the last 17 years he's been measuring one parameter, his own weight, then adding dozens of parameters with blood tests, thousands of parameters with uh, human genome characterization, and most recently millions of parameters through microbiome characterization. And, um, and uh, when he does the microbiome characterization, he'd been doing this for a couple of years, and don't worry if you don't understand anything in this diagram showing the relative amounts of the different kinds of microbes, because Larry didn't understand that either, despite uh, having a lot of people working on it and uh, spending a lot of compute time trying to interpret it. So this is why the profiles by themselves are not so useful, but if you interpret them with our tools, which Justine Debelius, a very uh, talented uh, postdoc in my lab, did, what you can see is when we make this map out of the same data I just showed you, you see this clear split between the blue and the red. You see him start off at one end of the blue, then travel through this, cross over to the red, and bounce around more or less at random in the red. 
So what's going on here? Well, when we link it up to his clinical data, what we see is that this initial shift is caused by a course of antibiotics. And then during this blue period, things are going very badly, uh, badly for Larry. So he's losing weight. He has frequent IBD symptoms. Uh, his life is not very good. So eventually he gets fed up and convinces his doctor to switch his medications. And what you see is this transformation going from the blue space into the red space. And then for that whole period where he was bouncing around more or less at random in the red space, uh, basically, uh, basically his weight goes back up to a healthy set point um, and he's essentially recovered. And had we known uh, Larry's individual places on this microbiome map, we would have been able to tell him that as soon as he crossed over into this red region that he was going to be fine and going to recover. And this is why it's critical that we get not just one sample but figure out how to make it possible to track people's microbiomes over time and relate each individual person's microbiome to themselves in states of health and disease. Um, of course, not everyone is as interested in this as Larry is, and these are the middle schoolers cheering our lab and learning that what we're going to do is use lasers and robots to look at the bacteria in their poop, all of which is literally true. Uh, but a lot of people have been fascinated to sign up at this point, and most, most crowdfunding projects in science are on the scale of a few thousand dollars. But with this, we've raised a couple of million already, essentially all in $99 increments from members of the general public. Although with the move to UCSD, we can now also take charitable donations um, to look at populations uh, that, that are, that are uh, underrepresented or uh, interesting from a clinical perspective and not able to afford the cost of the sequencing themselves. Um, and, uh, and this is Embriette Hyde, the, program manager, uh, sorry, the project manager for this project, uh, accepting at the Personal Genome Project meeting at Harvard Medical School last year, the People's Choice Award for the American Gut Project. And so these are people who have had their genome sequenced and they're getting all kinds of other things characterized. So we were up against full body MRI scans, we were up against regrowing parts of their body from stem cells. And what the, what the people were most interested in uh, was the microbiome. So, um, so, on the, uh, uh, so with American Gut, on the scale of, uh, of 10,000 people now, we've been able to see the links between the microbiome and things that nobody suspected it was involved with. So um, these power curves put together by Justine, basically on the x-axis, we're looking at the number of people per group that you need to find an effect. On the y-axis, this is the power. So one means 100% power to detect. 0.8 means 80% power. And the steeper the curve, the bigger the effect is. So like you might expect, age and inflammatory bowel disease and antibiotic use all have very large effects, but we can tell all kinds of other things about you, like for example, whether, you, whether you're male or female, uh, how much sleep you get at night, which you might not have thought was linked to your microbiome, uh, how, 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 much, uh, how much you weigh, uh, how much you drink, even how much you exercise, or I should say how much you say you exercise, because all of this is self-reported data. Uh, but one, uh, but one, one thing, so either there's an effect of exercise or an effect of lying about it. And we're, actu we're actually working with the coaches at UCSD Student Athletics at the moment in a controlled setting to find out which of those two things it is, because it's a lot harder for the student athletes to lie about their exercise when they have to do their activity uh, than it is for people just clicking on some forms on the web. But uh, you'll notice that the steepest curve over to the left in green is fascinating because it's the number of types of plants you eat. And what's amazing about this is that it suggests that lifestyle factors like diet can have an even bigger impact on your microbiome than things you have less control over, like disease and medications. And what we're trying to figure out at the moment with, uh, with Dr. Gordon Sachs in the Complementary and Integrative Medicine Program and Dr. Pam Taub uh, in, in the uh, cardiology, uh, uh, cardiology Rehab Clinic is can you counteract the effects of other, uh, other things on your microbiome by the right kind of plant-based diet. Um, so so we're, we're also spinning this off to a lot of other uh, populations. So we started launching internationally with uh, British gut and Australian gut because it was really easy to translate the materials from English into English. Uh, but we're now starting to move into other countries as well as into a range of clinical populations. And I'll just briefly show you the main uh, example we have of why you should care so much about where you are on this map. And uh, um, this is just to reorient you, and I'm going to show you some work we did with Mike, uh, Mike Sadowski and Alex Karutz at the University of Minnesota, looking at people with C. diff. So C. diff is one of the most common hospital-acquired diseases, and uh, you can see those, those uh, orange stars, right? This is a disease that kills 14,000 people a year in the U.S., and if you have C. diff, uh, like those people with those orange stars, your stool microbiome looks nothing like a healthy stool microbiome, uh, which, remember, is down the bottom in brown. So what's going to happen is that four of those patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one donor who, as you can see, is in the healthy region down at the bottom of this plot. And uh, th this is going to be kind of like what I showed you with the infant time series, only now each frame is going to be just one day in the life of, this, uh, of these people's microbiome instead of a whole week. 
But the question is the same, like how much do they come to resemble healthy stool over this time? Is it fast or slow? Is it a smooth or jagged transition? And, um, uh, and in case you're wondering how it's done, this is Bill Sanborn, who's our chair of gastroenterology, about to deliver a fecal transplant using hospital-grade uh, hospital stool. And five years ago, Bill told, uh, told Larry, when Larry was interested in a fecal transplant, that this procedure would never happen at UCSD, whereas now Bill himself is doing about three of them a week. So it's taken off remarkably as a treatment for C. diff. So anyway, let's start these people going and remember that they're, uh, they, they have terrible diarrhea. They're going to the bathroom dozens of times a day. And so four of those people um, are going to get this fecal transplant from that one donor down at the bottom. And you can see that immediately, like just within a day or two, all of their microbiomes completely transform into the healthy state. And coupled to this, all of their clinical symptoms are gone. And you can see that they stay in that healthy, uh, healthy microbiome state uh, with healthy clinical symptoms throughout months of follow up on this. And what's, what's especially amazing about this is that the last clinical trial that directly compared antibiotics to fecal transplant for recurrent C. diff, it had to be stopped early because the antibiotics were about 30% effective, which is typical for recurrent C. diff. The fecal transplant was over 90% effective, which is also typical. And so it was considered unethical to continue the trial given the huge difference between treatment groups. And so all of the people on antibiotics got the fecal transplant and most of them recovered. Um, and so the question that's facing us now is for what other diseases besides C. diff can we identify these problems with the microbiome that, that separate patients from healthy people? And, uh, and, and how, can we, uh, how can we guide the microbiome back to health, whether it's something as extreme as fecal transplant or as simple as diet or uh, somewhere in between, whether it's improved drugs, whether it's immunotherapy or phage therapy or probiotics or prebiotics or symbiotics or all of the other things that are emerging today. Um, and then for all of these diseases that are now being linked to the microbiome through this kind of technology and then proven to have a biological impact and a causal role in these mouse models, everything from heart disease to IBD uh, to IBS to, uh, to, to even cancer, uh, uh, even cancer now and Parkinson's disease, uh, how can we define the good and the bad regions on this map? But we really need to go beyond mapping the microbiome, which is what we're pretty good at now, and develop more of a kind of microbial GPS that tells us not just where am I right at the moment, but where do I want to go step by step? Uh, sorry, where, where do I want to go ultimately in terms of my microbiome on this map? And what do I want to do step by step in order to get there? And, um, and, uh, and, and ideally, we want to develop the system and make it so easy to use that even our children can use it. So you could imagine a kind of smart toilet where as soon as you flush, what it's going to do is do some kind of instant microbiome analysis or maybe a chemical analysis that we can translate to the microbiome and deliver those results to your smartphone, which let's face it, I bet you're using in there anyway, and uh, show you, you know, am I just going towards a good place or a bad place on the map? And is there anything I should do to change my behavior? But our ambitions are even beyond that. Um, so what we'd like to do is make it not an exotic procedure, but something as simple as examining yourself in the mirror in the morning. And so the concept here is that you could breathe on, that, on, on a smart mirror and remember that there's already breath tests for a number of microbiome disorders ranging from cystic fibrosis to SIBO, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the idea is that you breathe on that mirror and uh, it's backed by mass spectrometry or NMR uh, where you can get an instant chemical readout that you can display, probably in a more user-friendly uh, version than this. But uh, you're going to get an instant readout on that mirror uh, that you can translate to, your, to the microbiome using the same kind of technology that backs Google Translate and then puts you on the map and perhaps identifies, are you at risk for a particular problem based on your location on that map? And is there something in, in particular that you should do to bring you back into the healthy region? And uh, then the idea is that we could go even a step further and have that mirror communicate back to your smartphone where, uh, where, where you know, then uh, when, when you're in the supermarket and you're faced with row after row of yogurt, for example, uh, and you have no idea which one of those is the one that you should be picking, uh, maybe you can use augmented reality to zoom in on the one on the shelf that actually has the microbe that you want and then scan its barcode and figure out if you got the right one. So, um, so this, this, probably, uh, this, this probably all sounds like absurd science fiction, but it's, it's important to remember that uh, the, the, the smartphone that most of you have, um, uh, that the, the most of you probably have on you, this has about the same processing power as a Cray 2 supercomputer from the 1980s, right? So in just 30 years, you've gone from something that took a whole room to something that fits in the palm of your hand. And if you talk to one of the engineers on the Cray 2 project, and you told them in 30 years, uh, you know, this room-sized liquid-cooled computer that you're 
you're working on that takes a team of engineers just to keep it running. In 30 years, it's going to fit in the palm of your hand. It's going to be battery operated. It's going to be connected to over a billion other devices just like it worldwide uh, through a network that's faster than any network that exists on Earth today. You can only imagine what geniuses they would have seen that humanity had evolved into over those 30 years and then how sad they might be when they found out about like words with friends and uh, cat videos on YouTube and the kind of stuff that we actually use all that computation power for. Uh, but, but the reason why we can do that is that things that literally would have cost millions of dollars 30 years ago are now so cheap that they're free. And what it's important to remember is that in DNA sequencing, an equivalent to that advance over 30 years in computation, uh, that's just been packed into 10 years in DNA sequencing. And in the next 10 years, what we're going to see, uh, just like with the progress there between the Cray 2 and that smartphone, is the progress between the million dollar Illumina instruments over an IGM, so uh, a couple of buildings over that way, uh, to something that you'll be able to hold in your hand and use instantly. Uh, but, but that's going to be not on a scale of 30 years, but on a scale of 10 years. And that's why we need to figure out what are the right user interfaces to make all this data accessible on a human scale and to really understand it and to use it uh, and, and to use it both from an individual point of view and from a healthcare system point of view to improve health over a lifetime. And so it's precisely to do this kind of thing that I founded the Center for Microbiome Innovation here on campus last year. And what we're doing in the CMI is bringing together over 100 faculty members and uh, a whole range of corporate partners, including uh, including J and J, uh, Illumina, BASF, and uh, soon we hope many others, uh, to come together to get the smartest people from industry, uh, the smartest faculty members, the smartest students, to work together to build the kind of technology that we need to make this kind of vision a reality. Okay, so, uh, so so I left off the acknowledgement slides because I mostly mentioned people during the talk, but I do want to stress that this is a huge multidisciplinary effort that's bringing together computer scientists, microbiologists, clinicians, and what's really exciting about this is a prospect not to just gather all this data, but to make it understandable and interpretable so that you can use it uh, in your own lives. Uh, thanks again for listening.